Okay, I do have to finish. I do have to finish. Well, well, I don't know. You guys can decide. What do you want to do? Do you want me to wait for your peers to cover this material? No. 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 You just want to get stuff? Well, you should let Sherry alone. Well, I'm covering the other topic next Thursday. That's a long time to wait. I have to do it. Yeah, we're just going to do it today, screw it. All right. Okay, so, Gary, yeah, we're going to do what I wanted to do today, today, and it's too bad. So sad. Kids can't be here. Okay, very quickly, uh, shh. All right, very quickly a review of the conformal diagram or the Penrose diagram that we drew for flat space. Okay, well, of course, we've suppressed the angular coordinates in order to make this two-dimensional. I'm just going to draw this for reference. The vertical line is r equals zero, so that's the origin of the original uh, spherical polar coordinate system. And then lines of constant r that are not at zero form these sort of arcs that start at i minus and go up to i plus, where i minus and i plus are time like and time like future and time like past infinity. Future, past, infinity. Um, this is space-like infinity. And then we have scree plus and minus, which are these two regions here, which are light-like. Future, past, infinity. Okay, just a quick, and this is just a reminder of what we did last time, okay? Uh, uh, lines of constant t, t equals zero is a horizontal line through the middle, and then other lines of constant t are these sort of curves, uh, which uh, always end up out at i zero. And one of the beautiful things about these conformal diagrams is that they preserve the 45 degree opening of light cones. And so you can pick a point anywhere on that picture you want and draw the light cone, and it opens at 45 degrees. Uh, these two lines right here are at 45 degrees. I wasn't the best at drawing my triangle to illustrate that, but um, so this is at a 45 degree angle, that's at a 45 degree angle. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, all right. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct this for the Schwarzschild geometry. Oh, so, what? Yeah. So the Schwarzschild. Swatschild actually means black. <laughs> say it, say Without it. Black shield. I know. That's dope. I know, it's crazy. Black okay. shield, black. Yeah. YouTubers, click like and subscribe below. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, let's not have too much fun. So what does the conformal, now, now look, remember, this one little triangle is all of space time. I mean, we're suppressing the angular dimensions. But it has all of the radial, uh, the extent of radial positions and all of the positions in time. This is, who was at the talk last night? What did I draw for anti de Sitter space? The conformal diagram of anti de Sitter space where we grabbed infinity and brought it in. This is the same idea done in a slightly different way. Okay, so now we should ask, what does the corresponding diagram look like for a black hole geometry? And for the Schwarzschild case, what we have is the following. First of all, you can be outside of a Schwarzschild black hole, and if you're outside of a Schwarzschild black hole, things should actually look pretty similar to what it's like to be out in Minkowski space. Because one thing we know is if you go far away from a Schwarzschild black hole, it just becomes flat space. So everything to the right um, takes the structure just like, um, and I can already tell I'm going to regret this, so let me move it over a hair. This is where efficiency in my board technique will really pay off. So I minus, I plus, okay? And again, we have some lines of constant R and lines of constant T. But where things change is now we have instead of the vertical r equals zero line, we have a special value of r, 
and that's supposed to be at 45 degrees as well, which actually represents for us the horizon And lines of constant R, if we come over here, they now go this way. Okay. And now let's just think about this for a moment. If I'm outside of the horizon and I draw a light cone somewhere, and maybe this is where I can actually use the color. If I draw a light cone somewhere, notice that I am free to move anywhere in the future of the light cone. That means that I am free to pass through the horizon. I can stay outside of the black hole horizon, but if I stay outside of the black hole horizon, then I'm actually going to end up at that point I plus. I can't get to this surface. This surface is only reachable by things traveling at the speed of light. Not super obvious from the diagram, but it has to do with the fact that this surface is a finite distance away, whereas this surface is technically infinitely far away. So it gets a little tricky to try and get there. Um, okay, so of course we know that the really cool stuff about this geometry happens inside of the horizon. And so if we continue the picture, what we discover is that inside of the horizon, we get r equals zero as a horizontal line. And one of the important things about that is that once you're inside of the horizon, if you pick a point and draw your light cone, as you already know, your future is at r equals zero. It's unavoidable. Once you pass through the horizon of a black hole, you must move towards r equals zero. Notice, if for some reason I had drawn r equals zero as a vertical singularity, then you would be able to move away from it. But it's by virtue of the fact that the r equals zero in the conformal diagram is actually horizontal that indicates that you actually can't move away from it. Okay, you have to move towards it. Um, okay, this is what is called a time-like singularity, by the way. Uh, it's time-like because inside of the black hole, remember, r is acting like time because the coefficient of dr squared is negative. And we said that that's how time behaves when you're outside of the metric. And this is why when you're inside of a black hole, a Schwarzschild black hole, since R is acting like time, you can only move in one direction. Okay, and it happens to be towards smaller R. Um, okay, now uh, we know that this is not the complete story because there are geodesics that come from, say, back here and go into the space. And we can't really explain where they come from. And that's why we did the Kruskal coordinates and did the maximal extension. So if we do the maximal extension of this thing, then the picture gets really nice. So in this picture where we've maximally extended, we now have twiddled versions of everything. Okay. And so if you, if you remember the maximal extension, we can interpret as, first of all, there's asymptotic Minkowski space far to the right. There is also asymptotic Minkowski space far to the left. Okay. We could label this M twiddle if we want, whereas this is M. Okay. This horizon here represents the horizon of a, this one right here, say again? Yeah, it's a white hole. And you can easily see that if you're inside of that and you're moving in your future light cone, you can leave the white hole's horizon, but you can't go back. Okay? This is the white hole singularity. So this is also a point where r is equal to zero. Okay? And then as we talked about last time, leaving the white hole, you have a choice of which of these asymptotic universes to enter. And then once you enter an asymptotic universe, you can't get to the other asymptotic universe. You can't get from here to here or from here to here. The best you can do is two things from each of these can meet inside the black hole and compare notes for a little while until they're dead. It's really not worth it if you ask me. Okay? All right. Now, the whole point of doing this is because I want to show you what this looks like for the care geometry. That is the geometry we started studying last time that corresponds to rotating black holes. And we already know, as I have carefully preserved the information we ended on, that the care geometry, care geometry has a lot of 
radically different features. The Schwarzschild geometry for comparison is shown here. It's the limiting case of the curve when A is equal to zero. A is basically the angular momentum parameter. So in the Schwarzschild, we have one radius, we have one event horizon radius. Outside of it, you can move towards or away. And we, we found that from the sign of the delta term of the metric. Once you're inside the uh, horizon, you can only move towards R equals zero, and in this case, R equals zero represents a true curvature singularity. If we start spinning the black hole, but don't give it too much spin, we develop two different horizon radii, R minus and R plus. You can kind of think of it as when you spin this, there's a zero radius that blows up to R minus, and then R plus is this outer one. The singularity itself blows up into a ring, okay? And what's really interesting, and this is what I'm, I'm going through this reminder for, is that, as usual, outside of the outer horizon, you can move towards or away. Once you're inside of this intermediate area, you can only move in one direction. But then once you get inside of the inner horizon, you can actually move towards or away from the singularity if you like. Okay? We're going to see all of this reflected on the diagrams I'm about to draw, plus some cool stuff. And then the last interesting case is that in the extremal limit where a squared is equal to g squared m squared, what you can think of is that r minus grows until it becomes the same as r plus. So you basically lose this, this middle region and you get a situation like this where you're on the outside so you can move towards or away. Or if you're past the degenerate horizon, you're on the inside where you can still move towards or away. And as I said last time, this is a case you actually looked at in your homework even though you didn't realize it. Okay, so here we go. Um, for care, there are a couple of complications that make it a little bit more challenging. So A, um, uh, it looks different. So what I'm talking about is drawing the uh, conformal diagrams. It looks different. or different cases here. So you can't draw one conformal diagram for the care geometry because it actually is gonna look different if you're looking at the sub sub extremal case or the extremal case. We don't need to do this case, but that's just a Schwarzschild. And we're not gonna do this case because this is not a black hole. Okay. Another complication is that it depends on theta. So remember, in the, in the care geometry, we have this sort of squashed sphere. It's an oblate spheroid. You still have azimuthal symmetry in phi, but as you change theta, the geometry actually changes. You know, you can see that. It's bulging at theta equals 90. Okay, and it's sort of smallest along theta equals zero or theta equals pi, okay? What that means is that the geometry is different for different values of theta. The key difference, which we talked about last time, is the singularity, right? Because you have to be at theta equals pi over two to actually intersect with that singularity. It's not enough for you to be at r equals zero. You have to be at r equals zero and be at theta equals pi over two. Okay, so without any further ado, I'm just gonna draw these. So starting with the sub-extremal case, if a squared is less than g squared m squared, we have the following uh, picture. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, and let me just remind you of what rho squared looks like, because rho squared is really where, uh, that's theta, where the theta dependence enters. So we're going to start with the case where theta is pi over 2. And when theta is pi, is pi over 2, then this term is 0, and so rho squared is equal to 0 when r squared is equal to 0. Now, why do I care when rho squared is equal to 0? So that's, the singularity. That's, the, that's the location of the true curvature singularity. So when I'm looking at the geometry when theta is pi over 2, this term automatically goes away, and the singularity is at r equals 0. Okay? And then we'll look at a case where theta is not pi over 2 in just a moment. So here's what we've got for our geometry when theta is pi over 2. Looks something like this. So we start with 
a, a little chunk of asymptotically flat space because far away from any black hole, uh, we have flat space. We've constructed them that way. You can have black holes that are sitting in asymptotically empty the center space, like you looked at in your homework, but for now we're just going to have this. Okay. And then, as you might expect from the Schwarzschild case, we're going to have our outer, outer horizon, our plus. Okay. And the interpretation of the dotted curves here are exactly the same as they are here or here because you're outside of the black hole. Where the story gets interesting is when you go inside of the black hole. So let me make sure you can see that from afar. That is the R plus horizon. If you go inside of the horizon of a square black hole, you now enter a region that looks like this. Damn, this is so hard to do. Yep. Okay. And what you find is that, and I'm, I'm to, for, for, for notation's sake, to make life easy, I'm always going to indicate to you lines of constant R, and then the lines of constant T are perpendicular to those. Okay. So inside of the horizon, a line of constant R would look like that. Okay. And what this line corresponds to is actually R minus, the inner horizon. Okay. And just to go ahead and label, you know, the other things that I see, this actually also happens to be R minus, and this actually ends up being an R plus, but we're going to complete the diagram in a minute. So let me at least convey to you why that picture makes sense. If I enter through R plus and I'm in this region, then what I've done is I'm in this picture and I'm now here. But when I'm here, I must move towards R minus. Okay? But that's exactly what you see in this diamond, because if I'm inside of that diamond, I have to move in my light cone, which means I'm going to go to one of these two R minuses. Okay? The question is, where do I go when I go through an R minus? And this is where it gets really cool. If I go through, say, the one on the right, I end up in a region where there is a space-like singularity. This is a time-like singularity. Here in the inner region, it's a space-like singularity. So this is r equals zero. Lines of constant r in this region look like this. This is a lot like what we see when we're outside of the black hole. Remember, in this picture, r equals zero is a vertical line. This is just reflecting the fact that in this picture, when I'm inside of the inner horizon, I can move towards or away from r equals zero. I do not have to go to r equals zero. And that's seen in this diagram, because if r equals zero is vertical and you're inside, so this triangle is being inside of the inner horizon, if you're inside of the inner horizon, you can actually not go to r equals zero if you choose not to. Okay. Does, does, this, does this line of argument about where you can go based on the light cones make sense? Because I'm about to throw it all over the place. Is everybody clear on that? So you understand why in this picture, when you go in this region, you must go to R equals zero. And it's largely because the singularity is horizontal, or what we call time-like. But in this picture, the singularity is vertical or space-like, and that means when you're near it, you can go towards it or away from it. Well, here's the problem. What if you go away from it? Where do you go? You go by minus singularity. But you can only go up the diagram. Oh. You can't go, go down the diagram. All right. Um, it just repeats yeah, infinitely. Exactly. So what actually happens is that we have another diamond region. You should have warned us you were going to draw up so much. Like, I know. Sorry about that. I knew I was in trouble. This represents, the, this represents the inner horizon because what you've done is you've come through into this region, but now you've decided to move back out. So the first thing you do is you pass through R minus again. So this represents R minus. When you get here, lines of constant R are horizontal, but you are free to or you're not free, you must move 
towards R plus, so this becomes an R plus again. That if this is an R plus and you go out of R plus, you're an asymptotically flat space. Damn. It's kind of how I feel about lifetime. Right? So if you, if you go into the black hole, get here and decide to go out, you can do that. But the point of this picture is you don't exit into the universe you entered from. So this is where we go to a different universe? Next. Yes. Okay. okay. So, so you can literally pass into a spinning black hole, not die, leave it, and go to an asymptotic universe. But of course, you don't, when you get here, you don't have to go to the right, you can go to the left, which means that there is another copy of an asymptotic universe here. Well, how many universes are there? And then, of course, you can be here and say, well, what if I don't go to the right? What if I go to the left? Well, there's another copy of the interior here. And now you understand the picture that's emerging. Where you just keep tacking on copies and copies and copies and copies and copies ad infinitum like a very long centipede. Yeah! <laughs> we got there. Human centipede yeah, universe. Oh! Hey. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm kidding. No, no, I'm, I'm totally kidding. kidding. What's it called? But if you're in the inner region and then you go towards R minus and you pop out of R minus, aren't you in the region with in between R plus and R minus? So you're only forced next to R minus? Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, 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 really good point. So when I did the analysis here, I, what I said to you was in this region, delta is less than zero, so you can only move in one direction. But I wasn't really careful about determining whether that was only inwards or only outwards. And it turns out that figuring out whether you can only move inwards or outwards is determined by your initial trajectory. So if you enter from above, you're moving inwards, and once you get in this region, basically you're not allowed to turn around. But if you enter from below and enter this region, again, you're not allowed to turn around, and so you must only move outwards. Seeing that is a little bit more technical. But both of them follow from the observation that when delta is less than zero, the radial position is behaving like a time coordinate for which you can only move in one direction. I didn't make an argument that that had to only be inwards. I was just using some results that we anticipated, keeping the ambiguity alive because I knew where it was going in this diagram. Okay. So in this diagram, you're essentially, so in this diagram, it's clear because the future is up and you always have to be in the future light cone. So this is the quicker way to actually see that. Because remember, this is faithfully reconstructing where you can and can't go. Because when you do the conformal mapping, the light cones are preserved at 45. So if they're telling you that you're entering another universe, suck it up, camper. That's what you're going to do. So would you be exiting out of a white hole? Yeah. yeah. No, and, uh, it, well, so at this point, it's like, what do you call it? Like, yeah, it's a white hole because you leave it and you can't go back. But that white hole, so, so if I tacked another copy of this up here, the question is, would you call this a white hole or, or this a white, which one's a white? So like calling it a white hole is a nicety that we can only do in the Schwarzschild case because one of them is in the past and one of them is in the future. But here it's like, which one? Because they're all on the exact same footing. That's the hilarious thing. Yes? These things don't exist, correct? These things. <laughs> Like with Nancy over there. Uh, no, you're absolutely right. These things only exist in theoretical constructs because they require everything to exist eternally. Actual astrophysical black holes that we've taken pictures of <laughs> form from stellar collapse. So they do not have infinite lifetimes. Okay? And remember, this, this point right here is in the infinite past. If the black hole wasn't even around in the infinite past, this diagram doesn't work. There are corresponding diagrams for finite lifetime black holes, okay? But I want to stress to you that when GR predicts a geometry, however whacked out it is and maybe how distinct it is from what we physically are living in, GR needs to be well behaved on that geometry. And so this came up in the talk last night where we were talking about the holographic 
principle and the entanglement uh, idea, and you actually, to, to, to be able to make that holographic entanglement argument for a black hole in that particular context, you had to appeal to a situation like this where there was a second alternate universe. I'm, I'm not going to rehash the details of the talk last night, but um, so there's a lot of features of these geometries which might not seem like they, they, they might seem problematic, but they actually save some of the features of general relativity. It's consistency is what I'm talking about. It's consistency. Yes? So what like, what makes it necessary for this parallel universe to exist? Like Geodesic completeness. Geodesic. That is what this is based on. It's based on the idea that once you start drawing the picture, if you pick a point, then you want to be able to say that I can trace where the thing that got there came from. And there's no reason why that path should end unless it hits a singularity. Of course, in, in our universe, that, that all of those trajectories can be traced back to the Big Bang singularity, when space and time you know, began. Um, you can also have them end if they go into a black hole and terminate on a black hole singularity. So it's okay if you're here and this, you take a blue line that just dead ends there. But if you can move through a space without encountering a singularity, your path is infinite. All right? It's just the way it is. Okay, so, uh, so you can keep just patching this, this thing together. No, t no tile in this tile work is any better than any other. All right? Except that if that were the case, we'd have to live in one of them, but you know. All right, so uh, an alternate to this is the case when theta is not equal to pi over 2. And when theta is not equal to pi over 2, we already know something interesting, and that is that r equals 0 is non-singular. Okay? Because remember, to have rho squared equals to 0, you have to have both theta equals to 0 and r equals to 0. Sorry, theta equals pi over 2. If theta is not pi over 2, Rho squared cannot be zero, ever. If this is a positive number, this is a positive number. Okay, if this is not zero, you can't get that rho squared to vanish. Alex? Uh, is it necessary for the black hole to have existed for all time for the same conclusions, like that you can't go in and then go out into like another <coughs> No, no. So that's only if I'm trying to draw, uh, no, no. Uh, so, so this is genuinely the horizon geometry of a spinning black hole, okay? Um, but these conformal diagrams and the issue of geodesic completeness, so the, 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 the idea of geodesic completeness is the thing you kind of have to rethink when you're talking about non-eternal black holes, okay? Um, all right, so theta not equals pi over two, the picture's gonna look quite different. Because, for instance, when I draw the diagram, there better not be a singularity anywhere. Okay? And so I'm just going to bang this out really quickly. Um, so we can start with what happens if you're just outside of the whole shebang. And it's that same picture that we always draw. For our lines of crust, they look like this. There's an outer horizon, and there's an outer horizon in the past Oops, that we might emerge from. And then once you go inside, for the moment, um, it actually looks very similar to this. So we're going to have uh, inside, you're going to have our minus, our minus. Constant radial positions are like so. We missed you guys, so we decided we'd draw centipedes. Um, <laughs> similar to humans. I didn't say anything about human centipedes. But uh, oh, anyways. He let us live. Yeah, I'll put the Shh. thing. So the question where it gets interesting is what happens if you leave the region here, but theta is not equal to pi over two. If theta is not equal to pi over two, when you enter the when you enter into the the inner horizon, you're not going to see a singularity. What are you going to see? You're actually going to see. Okay, a geometry that looks like that. And in this geometry, r equals zero is just a good old vertical line again. And we have future and past null infinities. 
This guy is going to represent, um, yeah, yeah, so uh, this, is, this is going to be really weird. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my diagram is not right. This is incorrect. That should not be there. You can't go through R equals zero. Okay, so when you pass through your, you can go to R equals zero if you want, but you certainly don't need to. Okay. And if I choose not to, then I continue up. Oh, no, 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 no. It does need to be there. No, it doesn't. Oh. Yeah, I know, I know. I've got the diagram in my notes uh, written one way. I'm trying to remind myself. Hold on. Yes. I, does anybody have the textbook? Bring do you have it? No. Okay. I feel like the diagram in my notes is incorrect, but um, but I'm just I'm going to draw it anyway because I feel like I double checked it with the book. Um, but there's something about this that's got my spidey senses tingling. Um, uh, anyway, so if you pass through. Then uh, you can. You're basically continuing the process up again. Um, and and the observation that I make in my notes, which I'm now getting a little anxious about, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Um, and by the way, you've got your alternate universes. Uh, Shit. No, over here. Yeah. There we go. Things get hard to draw after a while. Uh, yes. So the idea here is that if I'm outside of the black hole, I can stay outside of the black hole, or I can move through the outer horizon. So I can move through R plus. That's uh, in this picture. And But once I'm inside of the outer horizon, I must move towards the inner horizon. I'm free to go through either of these inner horizons I want. If I choose to go through this one, then once I'm in this region, I'm free to go towards r equals zero or away from r equals zero, okay? So I could come in, say, hey, r equals zero, and turn around and go back out. If I turn around and go back out, I just go through here. But once I'm in here, I must move towards r plus, and then when I emerge from r plus, I am in yet again another asymptotic copy of space-time. But the interesting observation here is if I'm inside the inner horizon and I decide to go through the ring of the singularity, that is, I'm literally going to go in and go through there. So in order to pass through this thing, you have to be at theta not equals pi over 2. Okay, But you're going to go to r equals 0. And that means that you're going to pass through here, but what it tells you is that you, if you decide to pass through the ring singularity, the ring singularity is taking you to yet another asymptotic space-time. It's bewildering. Yeah. I know. I know. Make your head explode if you're not careful. Okay, so I have, I have more careful pictures drawn up in the notes, but um, in order to scoot along, because we're, we're easily burning through all the time that we have, and I haven't even finished the last lecture, um, I'm just going to very quickly draw the diagram for the extremal case. That's this one right here. And the interesting thing about the extremal case is, again, it's only got one horizon. You can enter it and you can leave it. And so there's a certain sense in which you can ask, is it a horizon at all? And if you can enter and leave it, is there anything interesting happening? And of course, it turns out that there is. So if I'm in the case where a squared equals g squared m squared, then my conformal diagram looks like this. Again, you start with an external space. You can stay outside. This is your horizon. If you pass, this is your uh, infinities. If you pass through the horizon, then where you end up is in a region where there is a singularity. But you do not have to visit that singularity. Remember, you can enter and turn around and leave. And if you turn around and leave, you do not go back to the space from which you entered.
So in this extreme, in this extremal case, you can enter and leave, but if you do that, you do not get back to the universe you came in from. So it is a horizon. It is telling you that once you enter, you cannot get back to where you came from. You can only understand that if you construct the Penrose diagram. If you just look at this, you say, oh, you know, it's, I can go inside the horizon and turn around and go back out. No, it's not that clean. Once you try and exit, you're going to exit into a different universe. Okay. Could we come back the other way? Because you just can go back into it from the other universe? No, that's the point. I mean, oh, that's that's the subtle point in it. You 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 can you cannot you cannot turn around and go back to the universe from which you entered. What's well, stopping these diagrams from like wrapping like a circle? Uh so that's uh well, well okay that is so first, my, my initial inclination was to say, oh, now you're talking about the topological structure of the universe. The reason why these can't wrap in a circle is because you could then follow a line of constant t, which actually closes on itself, and you end up with what's called a closed timeline curve. And then the issues of causality come to bear, which is probably why you're asking this. So if this thing somehow could be folded around and then stuck up its own um, bottom, Oh, so like then, uh, then, you know, this is you, this is your parents, you cruise through the thing, you come back here and kill your parents. Okay, not that I'm saying you should do that, but, you know, before you were born. And then you've got a, cause, a violation of causality. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right, that sounds like a long question. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, like, say you tied a rope to yourself. All right, and you crossed the horizon line, and you were able to somehow anchor like you're like put the rope like inside and then you, you then exit right like, like would what's the stop you from turning around because time's up because if you try to rope yourself she was like what well, it's just like if you go out, you'd see the rope supposedly, unless it just disappears. Sorry, I, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm not listening to you. I'm totally I'm standing up here and I'm like sorry. <laughs> My question Look, you, you put him in one presentation and he thinks he's all that. Plus all that. You weren't even there. You didn't even see yourself on the screen. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm having a bit. So I'm holding like eight pages of notes that right, I'm supposed sorry. to get through in 30 minutes. But I'm inclined not to even start them. <laughs> because I really don't want to shortchange this topic. Yeah. Um, so. I know, I know. So I, I think here's here's my tentative plan. Okay, my tentative plan is uh, we have four more lectures worth of material to cover. There's this, which you will find deeply satisfying. There is gravitational waves, which are timely, but nothing but technical calculations. Nothing inspiring in them. Uh, and then there are two lectures on cosmology, applying gravity to the entire universe. So, uh, of those four topics, oh, and this topic is essentially taking what you've learned about the rotating black hole and extracting from it the idea of black hole thermodynamics and the black hole information paradox, which is pretty rad. Uh, of those four topics, is there one that you're willing to forgo? The you made it sound like gravitational waves. Well, I know, but I'm biased. <laughs> I know, that was a super bias. I, I, I know, I know. I taught this course, I didn't do gravitational waves until the last time I taught this course, and that's the first time I put it in. It's actually a good lecture. It, you know, it, it really shows you like what it takes to actually you, do the calculations. you gave it already so we could go back and watch that lecture. True that, true that. So get rid of it. Can you just post it and put the notes up and we can just Yeah, can you just repost it again on like... Done. So that we can watch Done. it. Done. Done. And don't have to search for it? Cool. Done. What if we specifically, okay, so what if you do the second lecture on cosmology? Is your hair the, really braided? <laughs> it is actually in pigtails, thanks to uh, our wonderful friend Madison. Because where is she? I think she's there. I, I think both people right left. Oh, I uh, thought you were all together. Yeah. No, we took like three of the Yeah. Oh, okay. You, well, you're, in the, you're in the Ferrari? <laughs> Clearly, I have a crowd. Uh, okay, yeah. But, uh, 
What if we what if we just do the second lecture, not the first lecture? We don't want to learn anything about the start, just you know, second one. No. No. I think no. we've already made a problem. Get, Get rid of gravitational waves. Yeah. Yeah. That is gravitational waves separately and watching. Yeah, just yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. yeah. We'll, Especially okay. if it's like super technical, do we really want to answer? Well, I just want you to answer, answer my problem. Well no, okay, <laughs> I, but that's what I'm saying. I'm going to entertain any any and all questions you want about this material because we're not in a hurry to get through the next topic, which we just literally right, can't do. Yeah, yeah. Can I go with my <laughs> Can you what? I got. I forgot to eat dinner. Can I go? Can you go get food? You're leaving? No, no, no. It's upstairs. I'm just gonna put it in the microwave for a minute. Come back. Down. Yeah, that's fine. All that's right. Fine. <laughs> I'm saying like let's let's chillax. I got through last night, and personally, like after last night, I was just like, oh my god, I'm done. So happy. How long did you guys run? How long did you stay after? Just until like 9, 10 or 9, 15. It wasn't super late. But there were lots of really good questions um, from a lot of people. Uh, okay, so ask your question. All right, all right. And I, I'm not going to. Oh, so, you're going to so, come up and. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Mike, are you shy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So, like. It's the way he's like raring to ask the question. <laughs> so, like, I have a rope tied to me, right? Yes. And. Like there's a perimeter around this chair that is like the, the event horizon. Okay. Right? So I cross it. Okay. Yes. I somehow anchor like this rope, or not anchor, but like kind of like put a pulley somewhere in space. All right. So it's like kind of wrapped around, and then I go back out with the rope still attached to me out of the horizon. Oh, you're in a care black hole where you can enter and leave. Yeah, I'm in a care oh, okay. black. Okay. So yeah. then I come back out, right? And then supposedly if this rope is still attached to me, I can just look at where I entered and then the rope would be there. But does that mean that some other parallel universe me, but from the same universe, did the same thing, but then I just come out and like take his spot, and then it's like an infinite, you know, it's like an infinite loophole of where Mike goes into the horizon, never comes back out in the same universe, but then a different Mike comes out, and it's like, oh shit, some other alternate universe Mike did that. Like, that's what's confusing me. Can you come to the board and draw it? On the diagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I can, I can do that. I can do that. All right, all right. It's gonna work so much better if you actually do this. On the all right. Camera. Why are you? On, you're off camera again, Mike. Get on camera. I have conformal diagrams. That's, they're pretty. They're pretty bad. I don't, I don't diagrams, care about the conformal no. diagrams. <laughs> That's exactly what you. Just what? draw the group on the conformal diagram. All right. All right. All right. So this is this is the this is the whole what we're talking about, right? Okay. Yeah. Sub extremal. No, no, I want to talk about this one. Yeah. Oh, oh, the extreme case. one. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's guy. here. Right, right. So yeah, here, let, let me give you a couple of asymptotic universes to play around with. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you get it gets pretty efficient to draw these after a while. You're just like, oh, I know what's going on. Okay, there right. Wow. One pencil. Yeah. An artist. Oh my gosh, there's so much to draw. It never ends. Okay. All right, all right. So, so here is Photon Mike, okay. Photon Mike decides to enter this universe, but I have a rope attached to me, all right? And then, I probably need to stand where I can see what you're doing. Yeah, all right. So I go, I go into the event, event horizon of the extremal black hole. I have a rope attached to me, okay. Then, unless I want to like annihilate myself by going into the Don't do it, don't do it. Right? Don't I do go it. out. Talk and, him down, you guys, you gotta talk him down. <laughs> all right, and then, I come back out with the rope still attached to me, right? But yeah. this is not the same universe that I entered with the rope attached to me, right? I agree. It's a different one. Yeah. Which means that in order for that different one to still have a rope attached to me in the first place, something else that was not me in this universe did the same thing, and then I'd still come out with the rope attached. <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> right? if you can, does that make sense? Like, like you draw the pack of the rope. Yeah, draw the rope. Draw the rope. Just draw the rope. Here's the rope, but then if it came, it came. That answered your whole question over there. What the rope does? The rope comes out of the white hole, like on the other side. So there's still you're attached to the rope on one side, but then like. You go through the But there has to be like, there's like a, a space continuity that has to exist with this rope. Are, are you saying like you try to climb back out using the rope? No, I'm saying that like, it like, it, yeah, it's like interdimensionality rope, basically. Like, it would, it would be the, the one thing connecting these two universes would be this rope, but you can never go back and like untie yourself. 
and then have it come, like, you know, like, it, <laughs> I'm just gonna look like a crazy person on YouTube. <laughs> and you're, you're actually standing on screen. <laughs> All right, perfect. But like, it, it would make more sense if I just, if I did it like this, okay? So like, you're just using me, right? Space mic. Okay, and then there's a rope attached. He doesn't, he doesn't get out of this. All right, space mic goes in to the event horizon, okay? Space mic then anchors the rope here, okay? And then space mic exits, okay? But this space mic is in a different That's universe. A universe. Yes. Different universe than, than what I originally was in, right? But, but you're only in one of them. I'm only in one of you're them. You're not in both of them. Right. I don't, but my rope has threaded right? this It's threaded this thing. <laughs> But there has to be like there has to be some like spatial like existence of continuity in this rope, right? Where like something is connecting these two, right? So that means this thing must have come from somewhere in the first place. So either the one explanation is that like if I had my spaceship here in, in this universe, right? And this rope was attached to this this spaceship. Okay, and then there's another guy here. Right? So either this rope is actually attached to a spaceship that exists entirely in another dimension. An original space mic didn't see Wait, this thing. Say another dimension. That's not what you or, mean. I mean another universe. Yes. Another universe, Thank sorry. You. Either that's a spaceship in another universe or I'm still connected to the spaceship in the original universe. I'm going all the way around and then somehow I'm still connected to spaceship in other previous universe. And what happens if you pull it? I don't know. <laughs> um, so I, 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 I think either I don't understand your question, or I do understand your question, and I'm comfortable enough with this to realize that it, it is not really an issue. Um, so, first of all, the, what, the 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 idea that we have in this context is not that. Everything here is a copy, an exact copy of everything here. These are the geometries. And so when we do general relativity, we solve Einstein's equation, we get the geometry, and then we allow test particles like you and your rope, and even your spaceship, to move around those geometries without significantly altering them. So I could say this external universe is the same as this one, even though you might live in this one and you don't live in this one. That's okay. not a real biggie. Although technically the theory is completely self-consistent and so we could get a little hairy if we went and tried to use, say, Lagrangian to put sources and test objects all on equal footing. But um, one thing to be really careful about, which I like the picture you're drawing over there actually better than what you drew here, is um, you can ask yourself, is that thing a rope? No. That's the path I'm taking. Because this is space-time. Right? So if I just draw a curve in space time, is that what it means to look at a rope? Yeah, so you gotta be really, really careful. Um, if you take a rope in space time and you draw the rope in space time, what does it actually become? A sheet. Okay? Um, so does everybody understand what I'm saying? That this one dimensional curve could not represent an extended rope on a space time diagram, you would actually draw a sheet, which is not a big deal, okay? But you could extend this in one spatial direction and then draw a path so that one end of the extension still stays in this space time and the other one stays in this one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But you understand the technicality I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. You can't just draw a one dimensional curve and call it a rope in yeah. a space time diagram. That's why I didn't, I didn't know how to. Specifically drawing yeah, that's fine. So. But but we know from this picture what it is you're trying to convey. And then I, I guess for me, um, the geometry is fixed. You have this horizon from which things can emerge that do not exist in your universe. Right. It's just this thing out of which stuff can come. So I'm, I'm kicking back one day having a beer near this horizon checking it out, you know, took a little vacay, mm -hmm. and I'm hanging out on this horizon, and then at like four o'clock on Tuesday, there comes Mike. 
Out of the horizon. He's got a rope. And I'm just like, who are you? I've never seen you before. Because he doesn't exist in my universe. But then Mike shows up in my universe. He's dragging a rope. And I'm like, cool. Where's the other end of the rope? And you say, oh, it's in the universe I came from. Right. Which I would really not be able to appreciate because I don't know anything about that universe. Right. Unless I came from there secretly. But we're assuming I didn't. <laughs> well, so in that, in that comic Sorry, narrative, in that comic narrative, <laughs> where is the issue you're raising? Because I, I can literally see you emerge from a horizon without any explanation for where, where you came from, without any evidence where I'm already at, that you exist or that a rope exists or anything. Right. You can just emerge from that horizon, smiling, as but, you always are, and out <laughs> with a rope. Right. But I guess like my, my reasoning is like this that horizon for the extreme yeah, the extremal case, right? It's not like this like blackness, like this circular swath of black in space, right? Yes, it absolutely is. But if things can exit, then wouldn't the Why isn't it just a TV of another <laughs> universe? Yeah, so like if things if things enter okay, and then okay, so yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, so in the okay, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, no, no, no. You're totally right. It's a it's a it's super weird. Yeah, it is super weird. You you're actually asking a very very good question, and um, put the camera back center. Uh, Daniel Guff. Um, but so so it's interesting. So it's let me see if I can. Uh, by the way, those of you who showed up late, sorry. Um, okay, so this this radius is r equals two gm. This radius is r equals two gm. And if I'm here, and I look at the horizon. Me looking at that one horizon, because we're talking about this case here, me looking at that one horizon means that there are things which can come out of it if they emerge from down here. Okay? But if I send something towards it, then I'm necessarily sending it towards that horizon, that version of the horizon. Okay? But to me, these two things are degenerate in space. Okay? So, um, so I certainly have things emerging. I have things going in. What I do not have, and this is the important observation, what I do not have is the ability to throw something into it and, and like a boomerang and have it come back out. Like you would have. That can't happen. Because if I throw it in, it goes this way, and then it's not, it, it can't get down here to come out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, so I, I still don't know if I've quelled your fears about the rope. No, it's still terrifying. It's still <laughs> terrifying. Yeah. yeah, it's just. I mean, look, these are incredibly non-intuitive geometries. I mean, you know, I'm linking together an infinite number of alternate universes. I don't have a lot of intuition about that. Although I felt like I've lived a life before. I'm just kidding. Go ahead, you and then get. So wait, uh, none of these black holes are possible. Because like, how would it not uh, screw up the conservation of energy if you have things from a different universe coming into our universe? Exactamundo. Like, isn't that? So this could never happen. Exactamundo. It must be conservation of energy. Well, no, no, no. Conservation of it. So we're going to talk about energy in the next topic, which we we're really going to talk about today, but we ran out of time. Energy is notoriously difficult to define in general relativity. I'll give you a means of doing it. And by energy, I mean the energy of a space-time, not the energy of a test particle. That's pretty straightforward. Um, but with regards to conservation of energy, it's actually not that terrible. Because you can imagine it this way. And again, this is going a little bit beyond the split into sources that create geometries and then the test particles that do things. But if I just look at, say, this case, all right? So if I'm out here eating my Thai gold, Thai gold Curry. and I happen to Thai. notice coming out of this horizon like a big hunk of energy, mm -hmm. then I would say, oh my gosh, my universe just got energy from nowhere, mm -hmm. okay? 
Because after all, um, I don't I don't see directly what's inside of here, and I don't see what's inside of here. Okay. However, the size of this horizon is dependent on m, and m is all the mass that's in here. So if stuff comes spewing out of this white hole, the mass in principle would back react and get smaller, and I would recognize that by the decreasing size of that. I know it's weird. The decreasing size of that horizon. Okay. Similarly, if I take stuff and throw it into a black hole, you might say that violates energy conservation because once you throw it into a black hole, you can't see it anymore, so it effectively doesn't exist for you. But what happens is if you throw your trash into a... This is a big partial. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, where do you go next? Wow. They're so big. Those are really, really big. Oh God, you made them bigger. I, I literally, when, when you walked in, I thought you had toilet paper. <laughs> But you've got this massive marshmallows. Uh, okay. Anyway, anyway, my, my point is that... Oh, who's going to eat that one? Leo! Leo! Oh, let's get that. It's just sugar fruit. It's just sugar. It's sugar fruit. It's sugar fruit. It's sugar fruit. It's sugar fruit. It's my Adria, my point is is that you might think you could throw your trash into a black hole and you've violated the conservation of trash, uh, but really all you're going to do is make a bigger black hole. Similarly, things emerging from the white hole are going to make a smaller white but then, hole. So, but then if you throw something into a black hole and then you make it bigger and then automatically that thing goes into a different universe and gets smaller, then it just all stays... I'm like so glad you asked that. And this is where it gets really F. Okay? That's oh, where it hasn't done that already. <laughs> awesome that you say that. Listen to this and let it just explode your brain. Okay? Behind... This R plus horizon, that's a single horizon. Okay. Well, I mean, it's a horizon from your asymptotic space time and this one, but inside of that one horizon are all of these. Oh my God. He is going to throw up. He just ate a fist sized watermelon in one bite. Oh, no, I just spat it back. Oh, all right, listen, guys, I'm trying to rock the world. He doesn't like it. Inside of this one of this one horizon is an infinite number of universes. They're all contained inside of this. <laughs> Don't make this kinky, man. <laughs> you always so sexy. You you ask for it. You're the one who's making this uncomfortable right yeah. now. Me? Okay. Yes. Because I'm telling you there's an infinite number of universes. <laughs> He's back there making comments. You guys so why do you put mirrors in there? Why does it have to be kinky? <laughs> oh, sorry, I <laughs> <laughs> You should have seen the look on his face when he said it. I think that's the thing. I was reading more into what he was saying than I should have. I will apologize to you, Mike, but you kind of deserve it. <laughs> But, but my, my point is, my point is, is that it's, it's strange because you can look at this thing and this is a finite size, this is literally in your experience a finite size horizon. You can calculate the size of this, okay? But contained inside of it are all of these infinite copies of these universes that go up this category. Okay? They're all contained inside of that thing. So if you throw energy into that horizon, okay. it's never lost to some universe up the chain. It's always in that horizon. Because all of these copies of the universe are inside of that horizon. So you throw something in, that horizon gets a little bigger, and it's always going to remain bigger for you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because that, that's what you were asking about. You asked if I throw something in, this gets a little bigger, but what if it then escapes out to another universe? It's still inside of the horizon that you're experiencing. Well, then is our universe just a giant black hole within another universe? Again, the, all of these diagrams are theoretical constructs that don't have any relevance for our immediate universe. Yes? Even though they don't have any immediate relevance for, for our universe, what about black hole mergers if this was theoretically happening? Black hole mergers? Yeah. Uh, so what do you mean? Like two black holes merging together to kind of just end up as one. So again, like that doesn't even fit into this context because you, you cannot, so these, 
So <coughs> these black holes have to exist not only infinitely in the past, but also infinitely in the future. I know, but what if we did have those kinds of black holes and we So if you have astrophysical, astrophysical black holes do merge and form a single black right. hole. But the, but the conformal geometries of those things don't look anything like this. Okay, so, but you couldn't have two objects like this that can No, you can't, you can't take two eternal black, well, I mean, depends on what you mean. You can't take these, these dynamical geometries and have them merge because you're immediately violating this tenet that everything is, is true in the infinite future and the infinite past. And so you can't just go and suddenly say, well, what if it changes in, at 2.30 in the afternoon? Because what you draw is, so you've drawn, okay. So this is weird because when you do physics, you normally do physics at, you, you specify things in an instant of time, and then you go, hey, let's ask what happens in the future. And then the particles move and they bump into each other and stuff happens and you try and predict it. But there are areas of physics where what you do has a fundamentally different framework, okay? The two examples of that are if you ever do relativistic field theory, like quantum field theory, or if you do GR. If you write down a space-time geometry, you're writing down the history and the future of the geometry. You don't write down a geometry and say, what would happen if? Because the geometry you wrote down has got the future in it. And it's actually the same when you do quantum field theory, because in quantum field theory, you, you, you find the field configuration for all of space and time, and then you don't start with that and go, well, what if 10 minutes from now this happens? You've already written down what's happening 10 minutes from now, and beyond and beyond and beyond. So it's a very big shift from the way you're used to operating in physics, where you have differential equations, you give some initial conditions, and then you make a prediction about the time evolution. Here, the solution that we're looking for is the full, it's the full story for all of time. So you can't take that and then tweak it. So what are you, what are you tweaking? Okay, so if, I, you know, if, I've got, if I've got two charged particles and I, and I want to ask a question like you're asking, which is, well, well what, if they, what if they were thrown into each other? What would happen? What you're tweaking is the initial conditions. Still the same dynamics governing it, but what you're saying is, I'm going to throw them at each other. That's changing their initial velocities. Okay. When you, when you have these things, these are not initial conditions. These are the full solutions. So you can't suddenly say, oh, I'm going to take those two solutions and throw them into each other. These are the solutions themselves. So I, if that's not clear, like that's really worth just chewing on because it's a really, really profound shift from the way you're used to working with things in physics. So then does it even make sense for us to talk about throwing stuff into and out of these? You, it certainly does in the context of the limit in which we deal with this, where we say that the geometry in large part is determined by the very massive things. And if I take a, a grain of sand, it is, it is going to create a little bit of deformation of the geometry because a grain of sand has mass, it has energy. But compared to the geometry induced by the, the planet Earth, the, big, the picture to the, the best of your precision is probably not going to change. Fundamentally, it will change. But like, I don't think you're going to have a grain of sand that's going to completely restructure a picture like this. However, you know, when you start looking at really, really huge things, like two black holes, there's kind of no way that you could say, oh, this one's really small and this one's... Well, I guess you could because you've got like... 600 billion solar mass black holes and then three solar mass black holes. Um, but you just, I, I, when I talk about throwing things in or Mike's going in with a rope or whatever, these are all very, very small test, test subjects that pale in comparison to the, to the size and the influence of the sources that are creating the geometry. So kind of going off the topic of like the initial conditions thing, would the analog, like establishing initial conditions and analyzing the time level should be like, we're going to start, we're going to solve the system with two black holes moving towards each other and then find the geometry of that through time. But, cause yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, absolutely, right. absolutely. So remember when we solved, when we saw, so, so Einstein's equation is a set of differential equations. I mean, I'm not, we're not fundamentally using like brand new, you know, fancy ideas in math that you haven't used in other contexts. Einstein's equations is a set of partial differential equations. Highly nonlinear, coupled up wazoo, 
There's a lot of, but they're just differential equations. <coughs> to solve them, you have to specify boundary conditions, okay? Um, the, the thing is, is when you solve them, you are, you are solving for the full, you know, time evolution of, of the geometry, for the full time, you know, the full structure throughout time of the geometry. So if you want to pose a question like, two black holes merging, right, you, you can't go and say, I'm going to use the Schwarzschild geometry as a boundary condition to solve Einstein's equations because the Schwarzschild geometry is a solution to Einstein's equations. Okay? You see what I'm saying? The Schwarzschild yeah. solution is already a solution for all of time. Yeah, yeah. So you can't use that. So you have to go back and you have to be really careful about, okay, what does it mean to specify the boundary conditions? What exactly does that look like? And that's actually something which I was going to touch on in the lecture, which is now not going to be, and that's the gravitational waves lecture. Because that's where they actually do care about looking at situations where, for example, black holes merge. So you want to solve Einstein's equations with some initial conditions of two very massive things, and then you want to find the future uh, evolution of the geometry in response to that. And it, it, first, first and foremost, there's no way that you're going to do it analytically like we did with Schwarzschild. Okay, it's just it's way harder. Uh, but it, but it certainly can be done. Okay. Other questions? We have completely eaten up our time. I'm astonished. Other questions? All right, so uh, we, uh, as you are all aware, we, we held off the topic we were supposed to start today, uh, and we're going to start covering it next Thursday. We do not meet Tuesday because it's Physics Fest. Okay, you should all make it a point to attend. Uh, come and see your fellow seniors, their senior design projects, poster presentations, and then just general tomfoolery and enjoyment of uh, getting through another year. And then we will reconvene next Thursday, whereupon I will give you your final exam to be completed in the following week. All right? And I'll go ahead and uh, I'll just go ahead and post the um, the gravitation. Well, actually, the gravitational waves lecture is already posted in YouTube. I'll link it from the course website, uh, but you can look at that on your on your own time. It, I think it's a pretty good lecture. If you're if, if you're curious at all about gravitational waves, you should definitely have a look at it. Um, and I can answer questions that you might have about it um, if, they, if they come. All right.